important conference process which the Foreign Secretary William Hague has led on. Uh, it started in London last year and the second conference has just been held in Budapest and there'll be a third conference in Korea next year. And so we have cross Whitehall engagement on this and of course we also work very closely with our law enforcement agency the serious organized crime agency um, and uh, in fact the uh, the initiative is chaired by somebody from from soccer the serious organized crime agency Tim Crosland um, those of you who were here at the IGF in, in Nairobi last year, we'll know that uh, that um, conference uh, provided the opportunity for the Commonwealth IGF to hold a workshop on this proposal. And, and that enabled us then to go to Commonwealth heads of government with a concrete initiative uh, and to seek their endorsement and indeed we secured that endorsement at the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in Perth last October. Therefore, we have a clear mandate for this initiative, uh, courtesy of, of all Commonwealth Heads of Government. We've moved very quickly since then to get this initiative up and running in practical terms, to, to move it from concept, uh, from uh, articulation of clear objectives to actual implementation. We now have a constitution and an organizational structure in place. This is a three pillar structure consisting of the executive manage management group, which is composed of government representatives, including those governments which uh, fund the day-to-day -day operation of the initiative, which currently are Malta and the United Kingdom. Um, so that's the first pillar. The second pillar is a steering group comprised of the specialist organizations active in the area of capacity building in cybercrime, um, the partners, if you like, in the initiative who will deliver uh, the projects work with uh, the host governments for those projects and to um, generally resource the rollout of the initiative at the operational level. So that, that is the steering group. And the third pillar is the secretariat and to my right is, is Lara Pace uh, representing uh, the secretariat um, of the Commonwealth Cybercrime Initiative. Um, we, we always envisaged a holistic and multi-stakeholder approach to this initiative. Um, I, I mentioned at the beginning uh, the range of UK actors and ministries involved, um, but also this applies across the Commonwealth and uh, this initiative is quite unique really in bringing together such a wide variety of organisations. In the steering group, uh, we have, for example, the International Telecommunication Union, uh, the Council of Europe, ICANN, which coordinates the domain name system, the UN Office of Drugs and Crime, uh, a, a wide range of Commonwealth entities, the, the, the um, uh, law ministers, the Parliamentary Association, the Business uh, Council, and organizations from part, individual parts of the Commonwealth, from, from national uh, agencies and, and regional agencies, and we're going to hear from some of those um, today. So I really do see this as a unique um, coming together of, of key partners uh, that can have a real impact in terms of building capacity to combat uh, cybercrime. I think it's a great example, and I've talked about this in, in UN discussions about enhanced cooperation. This is enhanced cooperation. Um, and it's come out of dialogue in the, in, in the global um, internet governance forum. So we're seeing action as a result of dialogue in the IGF. So it has a lot of positives 
uh, which reflect on how effective the multi-stakeholder engagement is. Um, that's enough of the background and, and the beginning uh, and, and, and the origins of the initiative. Uh, in this workshop, we're going to discuss the practicalities of this cooperation and provide more tangible examples of how cooperation uh, actually uh, is, is working out. We have a, a pilot project already underway with, with, um, with Ghana. Ghana sought assistance across a, 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 a wide range of um, issues in the area of, of uh, cybercrime and this project is well underway. A scoping mission has already been undertaken and we'll hear more about that very shortly from, from Lara who, who will describe the Ghana project in some detail. Uh, joining us remotely uh, we have Dave Piscatello, the senior security technologist at ICANN. Uh, ICANN is on the steering group as I mentioned earlier and has also been nominated to the executive management group. Um, we also have Sala Tamanikai Waimaru of the Internet Governance Caucus, the Civil Society Caucus, uh, joining us from the Pacific. I hope the communications are all working. Uh, looking to Jasper for a reassurance on that score. We've got Dave at the moment, not Salah, but we'll, we'll try and, and hook up with, uh, with Salah. Um, we've got uh, Bernadette Lewis, Secretary General to my left here of the Caribbean Telecommunications Union, who is also represented on the, uh, on the steering group. Uh, we have Vladimir Radunovic of the Diplo Foundation. Has he, yeah, Vladimir, you're here. I, I was uh, looking for you earlier, but I'm glad you made it. Uh, to, to this workshop. I know you're very busy, like many of us, running from workshop to workshop, but uh, great to have you here. Um, and the Diplo Foundation is also on the steering group. And, um, and I have to say, uh, unfortunately, that uh, Teki Akuete was not able to join us uh, on, the, on the project, but as I say, Lara is going to, to update us on the, uh, on the Ghana project. So um, that's that's enough from me I think so uh, Lara would you like to um, talk a bit about uh, the Ghana project thank you thank you Mark um, this is really weird okay so um, as Mark has indicated our pilot project is in Ghana and um, a formal request for assistance was received back in January and um, in February we deployed a, a, a scoping mission to Accra the request was um, assistance in drafting a, a, a national strategy as per the CCI program of work and also the establishment of a CERT, a government CERT. Um, the, the, the team was composed of a, a, a team lead and um, the serious organized crime agency is leading the Ghana project uh, by way of uh, Tim Crossland who is also our EMG chair. And together with Tim, um, a representative from ITU for the CERT capability and also a representative of the private sector for the private sector expertise uh, were also deployed. We managed to get a, a summary report in time for our first steering group meeting and that was discussed at the, the first meeting in February. It took place on the 28th, I believe. And um, following discussion with the partner organizations that Mark has mentioned, um, a detailed report was submitted to the Minister of Communications um, towards the end of March, beginning of April. Um, we are very pleased that Ghana has taken on many of the recommendations that were submitted to the, the Ministry, and they have submitted a further request. Um, for assistance, a more detailed request. And um, the request outlines assistance uh, regarding a legal review and is extremely broad and encompassing and it also touches on um, aspects of uh, CERT uh, capability and um, critical infrastructure security and also public awareness. Uh, that request has been placed before our steering group at their second meeting uh, which was convened back in September. And this was where the, the practicality of the initiative was, was, was seen. So we had um, representatives from the 23 organizations 
and um, each we, we went through the request in detail and each organization um, stated what their potential contribution could be as mandated by their parent organization. Um, the detail of this was recorded and now the project lead is assessing and creating a detailed project plan to go back to Ghana and start on this further request. We estimate that I think um, uh, uh, the assistance is going to start on the ground in January of next year. So that's where we're at with um, uh, the Ghana project. We were hoping that Teki would be able to come and um, provide further detail on this, but unfortunately she's unwell. So I thought I would give you a superficial um, briefing on how the Ghana project came about and how each step is discussed with the steering group. And this is where the multi-stakeholder collaboration, cooperation is, is, is taking place. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Lara. Well, perhaps if anybody has a question about the Ghana project now, uh, I, I invite them to, to put that question now, if anybody does want any detail of that um, expanded on. Is there anybody? If not, okay, thanks. I'll, um, I'll proceed then to our, um, our panel discussion. We've got about... Um, I reckon about f 40 minutes, 45 minutes for this. Um, and, uh, and just a reminder that the question for this discussion is how can cooperation and multi-stakeholder collaboration impact the global fight against cybercrime and improve cybersecurity? So um, what I propose to do is to go around our panel with a, with a question and then invite others to um, others any of you here to also chip in with questions after we've we've initiated the first dis um, discussion with um, each panelist so um, I'll, I'll, I'll turn to you Lara with the first question um, what kind of assistance can a requesting state expect from the Commonwealth cybercrime initiative Okay, thanks, Mark. Um, uh, in our project document, we have listed certain principles um, regarding uh, uh, what is required um, from the CCI on behalf of a country in order to progress the assistance. So the program of work that is described in the project document is assisting uh, Commonwealth member states, and if we're working regionally, also countries that fall out of the Commonwealth membership, if it is a regional project, um, in drafting a national um, cybercrime strategy, a broad encompassing um, national strategy. The reason for this is that um, following feedback from the IGF, uh, the Commonwealth IGF, stakeholders are always um, uh, stating that cybersecurity and cybercrime are at the priority of the CIGF stakeholders. So we thought we would develop a program that can assist countries uh, in having an all-encompassing strategy which would deal with uh, the legal review, the capacity building for law enforcement, uh, the judiciary, the prosecution, and also enabling them to have the adequate tools for which that is required for them to carry out their job. Um, so I don't know if I've answered your question. Um, the yeah, I think I did. Did I? <laughs> yep, I, I think you've you've covered the essentials really of the kind of assistance that is available and um, under initiative. But perhaps if there's anybody who has a question on that particular aspect, the operation of the initiative and how, um, uh, what what you know degrees of assistance, what kind of issues can be raised uh, in requests for assistance under the initiative. Does anybody? Have a question. I, yeah. I, before before Be the before the question, can I just add one more thing? Um, obviously, for the CCI to be able to progress the work together with all the partner organisations, what is required is um, there has to be a, a, a formal request from a, a senior level in government. So it must be from uh, a minister who has responsibility for ICTs or a uh, prime minister in some cases that has a direct responsibility for ICTs. 
And um, uh, once that request is uh, received by the Secretariat, it is placed before the board and the steering group. And there are general five principles that, that, that we use to assess these requests. Number one, there has to be the, 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 an ultimate um, respect for human rights, freedom of expression. The assistance has to be, um, you know, by way of a broad strategy. So we advocate no drive-by training, to quote Gillian Murray from UNODC, and we really do advocate a holistic approach um, and a sustainable approach, which is really the, the, the key part of the initiative. So I just thought I'd add that in before you, you ask the questions. Yes, thanks. Thanks, Laura. Now, I, I saw there was a question on my left here. And if you could say your name and who you represent, that would be very useful. You'll have to come to a <coughs> mic. We haven't got many mics in here, but maybe there's a roving mic. Can, can, yeah. I, take, oh. can I take 30 seconds of your time? Yes. David, can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can. Okay, so we have David online, whenever you want. Okay, thank you, David. I'll leave it to the moderator to give you the floor once uh, the floor is open for you, okay? Yes, thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Glad, glad you're with us. Thanks. Okay, please. My name is Deirdre Williams. I am from St. Lucia in the West Indies. I'm associated with Diplo, but I'm here really as an end user of the system. And I think that that's a very important thing to say because I think we're very often excluded, however multi-stakeholder we might be. My question perhaps is too detailed, and if it is, just ignore me. There was recently a consultation in St. Lucia about creating a national policy for cybercrime. I ha have a former student who is connected with the bank, which happens to be the bank where I bank. I tried to contact him to see if he would be, if the bank would be interested in attending the meeting. He was on leave and I got a reply from somebody else who said, thank you, we have a cyber crime, a cyber security system in place and we, we're not interested essentially. I bank at that bank. When you do serious cyber crimes, my $200 that gets stolen out of my bank account probably means a great deal more than eight million being stolen from a bank. So I am concerned how all-embracing is all-embracing if you have a, that bank is a Canadian bank, although it's called First Caribbean, it's Canadian in its parent organization. Can they be forced to join the party? How, how does it work? Thanks. That's a very, very uh, pointed uh, question. Um, Bernadette, would you like to take that one on? Thanks. Certainly. Um, and I'm sure the bank does have a cybersecurity plan in place, but there is a bigger picture that needs to be considered. And I think this points to the need for a lot of education and public awareness, because I've heard that story several times across the region. Um, but, and I could also say with a certain degree of confidence that many of the largest banks in the Caribbean have had issues with cyber, cyber crime. But of course, it's not going to be reported for obvious reasons. Um, and um, there is the need to educate. That's where it starts. And also there's a need for um, establishing mechanisms whereby information pertaining to such crime, cyber crime, especially in the banking fraternity, could be reported but still in some respects give a certain amount of protection to the, for the reputation of the bank. Because they're not going to disclose this information, it is going to destroy confidence in the, in the systems. So it calls for mechanisms that would enable uh, reporting of these incidents and, um, and, and so in, to some degree protect the reputation of the institutions. But um, I, I want to go back to the fact that even if they think they have a system in place, you still need to raise the awareness of how 
great the risk is. And also, um, part of the education would be to encourage them to participate in a wider dialogue. In, a, in more comprehensive mechanisms that could deal with the issue of cybersecurity and cybercrime. I hope that answers the question. Thanks, Bernadette. And I wonder if um, law enforcement agents at the local level have, have a role here as well, I mean, which I, I see you're nodding. So um, that's certainly, and this initiative w will certainly uh, bring those um, law enforcement agencies which are um, active in, in, in countries where um, the initiative is, is, uh, has a project, will, they will be actively involved and, and part of that uh, uh, process of, of bringing together the key partners. Another question. Okay, please. Yeah, thank you. Better? Okay. I just learned a nice expression, a roving mic. I'll, uh, I, I, I'll remember that one. Um, my name is Walter Natis. I'm a, I'm a private consultant. And, uh, I did a workshop yesterday on cross-border incidents and co co cooperation on critical internet, internet infrastructure that you could think of phishing or cybercrime that goes across borders. And Lara and Jasper have been talking with me a lot of a uh, lot of times, so they won't be surprised with the, the question I'm going to, to ask. But for the debate here, um, my experience with the, the past seven years, I'm now almost eight. I'm working on international and national relationships. Is that to go on where 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 you just left off? Is that a lot of people are not used to talk to each other. Some don't even want to talk to each other, but they certainly need each other to come to an all-encompassing or holistic solution within a country, let alone abroad. Um, how does the project look at the, the, the getting the people involved that actually need to be involved at a very high level to make sure that they more or less force others to come to the table who may not want to be there for whatever reason uh, sometimes happens within the country. The organizations just don't cooperate. Thanks very much. I mean, that's a very interesting um, point. Um, it's very important for any project under this initiative to have effective coordination at, on the ground for the government, uh, you know, in liaising with all the partners at an appropriate level so that um, you've, you've got um, effective and uh, coherent lines of communication and the people are actually properly brought together and engaged. I mean, that's, I think, a key point, ensuring that coordination amongst the, uh, the project partners and also at the country end is, is effective and, and secure. I don't know if that was the answer that was given to you earlier, but if uh, I, uh, that's certainly my expectation. I don't know if Lara, you uh, have? I can't hear this, so someone else wants to do it. Oh, uh, Lara, Lara didn't hear that, but... Um, um, Bernadette or uh, Dave. Dave's with us uh, in the middle of the night. I don't know whether Dave or Bernadette or Vlada ha have anything to add to that. Yes, um, I I'm just going to, comment to add speak to the, to the previous question about of raising awareness of education. Oh, Dave, Dave is starts. speaking. Okay. Yes. Um, can you hear me? Yep. Go ahead, Dave. Thanks very much. Sure. Um, I, I think that you know, one of the goals of the initiative, uh, and certainly um, is something we discussed at our last steering group meeting, is to to raise security awareness um, from 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 sort of every lot layer um, involved in the internet, from the user all the way up through courts of law. Um, there are there are some some inhibitors here that are, are, are fairly obvious, and, and the most obvious to me being a security professional is that we have a, a wealth of information that seems to be mired among people who practice security. Um, and part of that is that uh, sharing that information um, 
is, is, is non-trivial, uh, uh, language um, being the most difficult um, inhibitor. Um, you know, for example, I, can, I could sit for an hour and share um, many, many sites and many projects, including a project that I, I work on called Secure the Human, um, and that's a, a SANS project that, that has marvelous information. Um, I can't share that in other languages. So I think one of, the, one of the, the hurdles that we have to overcome is how to actually deliver um, much of this material in, you know, in a local language. Okay, thanks, Dave. Bernadette, did you want to come in on this as well? Yes, I quite agree with Dave. There's a lot of information out there. But even in terms of a, the, a national environment where you speak one language, explaining the significance or the, the level of risk, because at the end of the day, we're really talking about risk and mitigating uh, the risks, even that is a challenge. So I quite agree with Dave. One, the education and awareness are of paramount importance. That is your starting point. And we have found um, when we present the information in the appropriate language that is comprehensible to the audience, that you can have quite a significant impact. And I also uh, agree with, with, with Dave, there are levels um, which you have to address with the type of information that is relevant, appropriate to the level. So in the Caribbean, we focus not just on the governments, we focus on the, ordinary, the man in the street, the, the technical groups, the business groups, the governments, and the, the story at these different levels is different, right? When you look at the uh, proceeds from cybercrime, they far exceed the, the GDPs of many Caribbean countries. So the risk is huge. That is what the government needs to hear and to understand that organized, that, that cybercrime is organized big business and it has the potential to decimate the, the, the real economy. Uh, when we speak to the man on the street, it's a different conversation. It's like, um, as Mrs. Williams said, she's concerned about $200 in her bank account, right? So the, the, the explanation, the education is at different levels and it doesn't stop. It has to be a progressive and continuous program of outreach and education to multiple stakeholders. Thank you very much, Bernadette. Oh, you want to come back? Yep. Okay. Thank you. Then I can say a little bit on the outcome of my workshop, which will probably uh, be of benefit here, is that one of the things people said and agreed upon in the, in the, in the panel is that you have to find the right connectors, they called it, which is exactly the examples that you've given, that's going to reach out to the people and make sure that they get out of their silos, because everybody is used to work within their own silo and try to get them out of it and find the connectors within the other silos which will get the things going, and that will be experts or people with another interest than others, but you have to identify them, and that's the only chance you probably have at breaking through barriers which may have been there for, for hundreds of years, who knows, within specific organizations. Okay, thanks very much. I, I'm, I'm sure we all very much agree with that. Um, Dave, if I could come back to you uh, with a question about ICANN's involvement in this initi initiative. Um, would you like to explain how, how um, you see ICANN's contribution developing and, and how um, working within the steering group is um, providing ICANN with the opportunity to expand its uh, capacity building efforts with regard to the domain name system? Thanks. Yeah, I'd love to. Um, ICANN was invited to, you know, to discuss the purpose and goals of the initiative um, somewhere along the lines of October and November of last year. And um, 
my first reaction to what the initiative was attempting to accomplish was that it was uh, very synergistic with uh, some of the work that ICANN um, defines and, you know, and provides for in its Security, Stability, and Resiliency Plan, which is an annual um, project um, allocation of funds, uh, in particular allocation of funds for um, training in, in the, our area of expertise, and, uh, which is the domain name system and um, the Internet's um, yeah, unique identifiers, such as um, IP addresses. Um, so when I joined the steering group, there were, there were two things I wanted to try to try to accomplish. One was to, to understand how we could continue to, um, to do the kinds of training that we, we already do um, and have delivered to, you know, to a number of, of countries um, and focus, at least initially, on, on bringing that, um, that capability and capacity building, uh, which is a technical and operational um, level uh, to to the Commonwealth in particular, um, and uh, my second goal was to to make absolutely certain that the project um, encompassed uh, multi stakeholderism. Uh, you know, my experience in in uh, global internet security um, for the past twenty years has you know, has been one where uh, the private sector you know, has pretty much um, had a very, very significant role, if not the lead, in uh, most of the you know, the major um, confrontations and mitigations of botnets, of phishing attacks, of you know, of uh, anti-spam campaigns, and the like. And so, I think it's very important that um, we we marry that capability, which is which is considerable um, and deep pocketed, with you know, in particular governments that don't necessarily have. Um, a lot of the wherewithal, a lot of the financial uh, capability, and and, and so uh, I was I was very um, keen and um, very uh, assertive, let's say, um, in in insisting that we we bring other organizations into the the initiative, um, in particular the anti phishing working group as an example, and then the ICSPA as another example of um, of partners who can bring, um, you know. Basically, bring you know lawyers, guns, and money. If you if you're familiar with the song, bring people who actually know the space, um, understand how to pursue crime on you know, and um, you know and combat you know the, the technological advances, or at least contend with the technological advances that the cyber criminals um, seem to constantly throw in, you know in front of us. Um, so I was very happy. You know, um, and flattered to be you know, uh, invited to be on the uh, the EMG, uh, in particular because I think that it's important that the voice of multi stakeholderism is um, is impressed upon the the Commonwealth and the member states as you know a very very proven method of you know of you know, of combating crime and a necessary one to move forward. Okay, thanks very much, Dave. I mean, do you think? Um, the coming together of so many key partners is going to help um, with ICANN's objectives in this in this field, and likewise the other partners. Do you, do you think this um, interaction around the table as 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 a partner in the steering group, and now also in in the management of the initiative, you feel that this is a template for for working in collaboration that uh, perhaps other um, organizations might learn from absolutely um, you know the I can and the and the initiative have you know have many val you know, values that they share and you know we we by no means um, want to you know, go outside our remit you know our remit is the internet's name and number spaces um, the CCI by definition has a broader remit um, and even though we could probably be successful independently from the initiative in building DNS capacity, um, operating alone and just in that one little silo is not as effective as you know, as a strategy that that allows the member states to benefit when all the other aspects of any crime are being addressed by other participants. And we're building a, you know, a strong knowledge base and capacity um, for each member state locally, so that they can securely operate their networks. They can 
um, investigates cybercrime competently. They can establish um, uniform uh, or common law, and all these can be done, you know, in the synergy with what we already do. Thanks, Dave. We, we've also got Nigel Hickson in the room from ICANN. I, I think, Nigel, you wanted to come in on this as well. Yeah, thanks. Yes, thank, uh, yes, thank you very much indeed. Uh, Dave, hi, greetings. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm Nigel Hickson, the uh, Vice President for uh, ICANN for uh, Europe. Perhaps I could just say uh, a couple of words on this, because I think uh, some of you might have heard our, our Chief Executive, uh, Fadi Jihadi, speak uh, this week in the, uh, in, the, in the opening session. And I, I, I just wanted to say that in terms of this initiative, uh, which I think we consider very important and very worthwhile and uh, something that uh, in, indeed is, is, is necessary. This does indeed sort of fit within the new ICANN, if you see what I mean. I mean, clearly ICANN has a, has a, has a remit, as David said, which is just part of the Internet ecosystem. But in terms of the capacity building needed so we can have an open, secure and interoperable Internet, I think we all have a role to play. And given that ICANN's mission is exactly that, then I think we have a, 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 part, a part role to play in this, in this overall initiative. And I, I think what's important is that we're capacity building. We're, what we're doing is, is, is trying to enable countries to take the decisions, take the steps for themselves. One is not going in and saying this is a, a tailor-made solution, just adopt this, just tick the box or, or, or whatever. This is a, a collaborative venture uh, among a number of different partners and I think what's so important is whatever stage of development a country is in and and you might say well it's all right very well for you to say that you're probably English or something or American. Well I'm certainly not American because I can't spell Los Angeles uh, but I am English and let me say that I was involved right at the beginning of cybercrime le legislation in the UK. And believe you me, we were just totally hopeless when we started, when we started applying cybercrime legislation. We just had no idea what to do in the UK. We, we just had, if you like, we might have had capacity. I'm not saying we didn't you know, have infrastructure and capacity, but we had no clue at all about what aspects of cybercrime we should look for, what collaboration we should have, and to an extent, some of our legislation, which later led to, you know, European law, et cetera, et cetera, was really put together by a collaborative effort between a number of different organizations and people. So that's where you start on these projects. Thank you. Thank you, Nigel. And I think we are experiencing the same sort of situation amongst uh, administrations who are contacting uh, the initiative they don't know where to start, you know, the kind of situation that we, the UK, were in uh, um, uh, those years ago. Um, this initiative is going to help those administrations establish focus and priorities through the coming together of the expertise, working jointly with um, the officials and, and partners on the ground in, in the country concerned. Now, we have two questions remotely, I believe, so let's go to them and then we'll turn to Diplo and, and, uh, and Vlada can give us uh, the Diplo perspective on the initiative. But anyway, let's turn to the questions first. Thank you. Thank you. So the first question is from Alex Serafimov in Abers Aberystwyth University. And his question is, what is the relation of cybercrime to, si to terrorism in the panel's opinion? That is quite a challenging question. <laughs> I think we can all agree on that. Um, I mean, I will kick off, and perhaps others might want to chip in um, who, who are with this initiative uh, right at the beginning. We felt that cyber terrorism was not going to be the primary objective for this initiative, that we would focus on, on crime, and that's where we could most effectively marshal the expertise and, and partners. So um, we kind of drew a line. I don't know how easy it is going to be to maintain that line in every case, but it's clearly at the top of a lot of administration's agendas, cyber threats, terrorist threats, uh, using uh, um, uh, cyber technologies and so on. So it's a very interesting question. We'll see how it goes. I mean, there may be instances where 
you know, the, the terrorist threat uh, may, um, may, may be manifest in, in what the uh, country, what an individual country is requesting in, in terms of assistance. And we'll have to see how we handle that kind of request. But that, those are my thoughts on it. I don't know if anybody else has any other views on that. Um, not at the moment. I don't see. I'll take a shot. But it's, if you'd like. thank you very much for that question, Alex. That's much appreciated. We've got a second. Oh, Dave. Sorry, sorry, Dave. No Please come in on that. Um, Thanks. This this is a question that comes up quite a bit in the security community, and and I'll give you the the, the simplest answer. Um, Cybercrime is usually for profit. There is a there is an objective. Um, and a very clear one by the, the perpetrators to to have some sort of financial gain or tangible gain from their activities. Um, cyber terrorism has a different agenda. It's usually political. Um, it you know may be revolutionary. It may be in some people's perspectives, in the perspectives of the people who are being um, terrorized. It's not necessarily revolutionary, but criminal. But it's a different kind of crime. Um, the, the tools that people use, the, the methodologies that, that um, the security uh, profession you know, and governments use to, you know, to identify um, you know, cybercrime activity uh, you know, have some overlap with terrorism, but there's a very, very big difference in the way that you treat the intelligence that you and surveillance that you conduct. Um, and you know, the, I think in some respects, the they tend to look the same, um, but the, when you're investigating terrorism versus investigating cybercrime, there's a, there, there are very, very um, subtle distinctions in how you pursue, um, you know, with, uh, what, how broadly you extend your um, web of trust uh, among the participants. Uh, in in cybercrime, uh, crime, that we, we often have a great deal of, of very um, open collaboration that doesn't normally take place among um, intelligence uh, agencies as they're uh, trying to, uh, you know, um, pursue terrorism. Uh, you know, in, in obviously, because uh, any intelligence that's leaked actually um, would be to the benefit of the terrorist. That's pretty much the simplest way to describe it. Thanks. Thanks very much, Dave. That's that's very helpful. I appreciate. It. There was one mm -hmm. more. Oh, sorry, Vlad. You wanted to come in on this particular point. Yeah. Okay. Quickly, Vlad, and then we'll go to that second question. Okay. Yeah. I just w when we discuss cybersecurity, um, and I guess we should have it as holistically. Even if we talk about cybercrime, we should take a look at cybersecurity in general. And then cybersecurity, in a way, consists of cybercrime and cyber warfare and cyber terrorism and even safety to some extent. I think we have to observe all these aspects when we are dealing even only with cybercrime, especially when we are talking about strategic documents or whatever on the level of the, of the state. So we should have it in mind, but I fully agree that probably from case by case and government or country by country, we should discuss in the nuances each of these, these uh, issues. Yes, thank yes I, I, I agree. That's my sort of sense as well. Let's go to that second. Thank you, Alex, for that question. And let's go to that second uh, Remote question, uh, Jasper, thanks. There was also a quick comment from Nigel Thomas that you can use cybercrime to fund terrorism on the same point. But then I'll move on to Shiba Mohammed from ISAC Trinidad and Tobago. Her question is um, that cybercrime is a, such a cross-border issue that it cannot be looked at only on a compar compartmentalized national level. National boundaries are no fences in this internet-enabled world with its multi-nation focus that presents a distinct opportunity. What mechanisms can we adopt in a cross-national sharing of resources, practices, and partnerships? Thanks very much. That's a very good question. We, um, we certainly see this initiative as one that provides a vehicle for, for sharing and not actually also for creating efficiencies where you have uh, countries in a particular region who have the same uh, uh, requ um, need for uh, additional capacity for, for training up of judges or, or law enforcement cooperation to be set in, set in train, uh, this initiative will, will help do that. But Lara, did you have a comment on that? Quick comment. Thank you, Shiba. Um, I think what we're doing, uh, from a Commonwealth perspective, the Commonwealth is um, the facilitator in assisting with countries 
dealing with cybercrime. I mean, all the organizations that are on our steering group are very involved in addressing cybercrime as per their mandate and expertise. I think the, the added benefit of the CCI is really that, you know, we have a team, we have a board, and we're trying to create a map of everybody's expertise and get everybody to work together. Uh, when I say everybody, it's not everybody, obviously. <laughs> I mean, we mentioned 20, 23 organizations earlier, but I think it's a significant uh, uh, amount of organizations with very, very um, specific expertise that are working together to um, uh, uh, build the adequate capacity in Commonwealth countries. So I don't know if I've answered Sheba's um, question, but I just wanted to make that comment because, um, you know, it's not like the CCI is reinventing the wheel. What we're doing is um, we're assisting and coordinating, I think. Yeah. Yep. Uh, Lara, uh, thanks for that. And Bernadette, you, you, you wanted to come in on that as well. Thank you, Sheba, for that. Um, very good question. Um, the whole issue of dealing with cyber security and cyber crime, it is indeed an ever increasing uh, ever increasing circles of engagement that starts at the national level, at the regional level, at the international level. And it seeks to engage many different stakeholders in that increasing circle of influence and engagement. So that we find at the country level, it is necessary, uh, coming from the perspective of the Caribbean Telecommunications Union, although our primary stakeholders have traditionally been ICT and telecommunications ministers, we have found it necessary to engage the judiciary, the law enforcement officials, uh, business, more of the technical, non-traditional um, uh, participants in the business, and uh, ministries of national security. We have had to engage them at the national level with outreach, education, and awareness. At the regional le level, we are developing a cybersecurity um, framework, and we have been bringing together the uh, ministers of national security, uh, attorneys general from across the region, just groups uh, of, of stakeholders. At the international level or at the hemispheric level, we've been working with the OAS and the um, Commission Against uh, Anti-Terrorism, SICTE. And we are now involved at the international level, we're now involved with the CCI, this initiative. So it isn't, you can't stop at any particular level because of the nature, as you rightly said, the nature of cybercrime. And it calls for these expanding circles of engagement if you are going to mount an effective um, defense or, or, or um, be able to deal effectively with the whole issue of cybercrime. Thank you. Thank you, Bernadette. And I guess and a, a question is how this particular initiative can, can ensure that uh, we don't stop at borders, that uh, we may have a request from one country, but the neighboring country may well be in the same situation, but we don't hear from that. How, how do you think we can avoid that kind of situation, that we don't lose the opportunity to bring in other uh, countries that uh, may not, for, for one reason, uh, that we don't, we're not aware of, not wish to get engaged, but actually would, uh, would benefit from engagement because we're, we're in the region. I suppose the CTU has the advantage of being a regional organization and a lot of our work, and the majority of our work is done at the regional level. And for in regions where you don't have an organization that is sort of similar or equivalent to the CTU, you would need to look at the mechanisms that exist to see how you could foster those sort of col collaborations. Now, I just wanted to mention that the CTU was set up as a strictly intergovernmental organization. Our members were governments of the Caribbean. 
But just given the evolution of, of the whole uh, technological evolution, we found we could not continue being just an intergovernmental organization. So we have expanded the membership to include private sector organizations, um, civil society, um, the uh, non-governmental organizations, and so on. And we have we work in strategic partnerships with many organizations. And that is the only way we could get our work done. And on the basis of this whole issue of cybersecurity, that is the same approach we've had to take. Um, engaging in strategic partnerships with the organizations uh, that will reach the audiences that you would not traditionally reach. Thank you, Bernadette. Um, Dave, did you want to comment on this as well? Thanks. Uh, yeah, I, I posted something in the, uh, in the chat. Um, so I, I was uh, going to raise the point that you know, part, we're not just focusing on you know on doing this technology dump to to make everyone um, a cyber forensic expert in a country. Uh, you know, uh, the initiative will also attempt to encourage the adoption of, of common law um, among member states and with a with a common basis for what is a crime and what is not. Um, at least from my experience, uh, it will make things so much. Um, more streamlined when you know when countries member states and 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 private sector um you know, and law enforcement agents from you know from uh, different countries can cooperate across their borders to identify and apprehend and prosecute cyber criminals i mean one of the hardest things to do uh in in my industry is to um to suspend a domain that's being used for a phishing attack as an example if that if that domain is in a different country, is outside the jurisdiction of you know of the uh, the the um, country where the uh, the warrant is is issued, um, and so breaking that barrier would be a significant accomplishment for the initiative. If there were a way for a you know a, a warrant to be valid in in all 50 plus member states, imagine how much better um, you know. Uh, how, or how much more efficient we would be in, you know, taking down uh, illegal pharmaceutical sites, in stopping human trafficking, in um, in, in eliminating, uh, you know, uh, in, impersonation and fraud and financial, you know, financial harm. Yes, thank you, Dave. And that sort of reminds us really that uh, this initiative is, is should not simply be one which is. Um, there to respond to requests alone, that perhaps there are some strategic issues, like you say, of um, um, uh, where, where a, a, a common approach to a particular problem can be developed through the agreement of the Commonwealth membership, uh, whether, whether it's acceptance of a warrant or, or, or whatever, in, in pursuit of a particular criminal uh, who is operating in one country and active um, uh, and creating an impact in another country. So. That's something I think this initiative should bear in mind for the future as we look ahead. Uh, we start to look at some of the strategic issues that come out of the project working uh, and the capacity building um, activities that uh, uh, inevitably we're going to learn from uh, and, and, and draw higher level objectives uh, perhaps in, in the future. That's uh, certainly my vision for this initiative. Now we had, I think, Another question in the room, if I understand correctly, and then and and another question over there, and then eventually we'll get get to Vladar to uh, to explain Diplo's uh, 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 approach to this and how this initiative complements Diplo's work. But let's go to these two questions first. Thank you. Yeah, and if you could say, as I say, say you who you are when you start. Thank you. Thank you, Chairperson. Are you hearing me? Uh, I'm Tom Chizito from Uganda, a diplomat, and uh, recently I've just completed a course on uh, cybersecurity. But during our discussions, and it has come back here, we've agreed that uh, one of the ways of combating cybercrime across borders is uh, multinational uh, cross-border understanding and collaboration. I was wondering. Uh, 
there are situations where a particular country or nation defines a crime, a particular activity as a crime, yet another country doesn't consider it as a crime. And uh, for these two countries to come to a mutual understanding, there has to be a compromise. And uh, at times, some people might not agree to compromise on a particular standing, which will cause a disagreement. I'm wondering whether in this house we can come up with a, a mechanism of bypassing such disagreements which might affect the, un, the collaborations. I know there are some, there are some uh, regional, regional collaborations, like in East Africa, we have conditions for you to join the East African community and uh, they are preset. For, for you to be part of the East African community, you have to agree to them. But uh, there are countries which, there are regions which don't have such systems. Can we come up with a mechanism to bypass this possible occurrence? Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Very, uh, very interesting question. I mentioned at the beginning we have um, Commonwealth law ministers um, engaged and endorsing this initiative. And that's probably a question that we can certainly um, um, take their advice on, the law ministers and their legal advisors uh, within their respective administrations, and whether uh, the, the law ministers, when they meet periodically, and um, uh, they in fact met um, and um, agreed that uh, cybercrime was a major issue just at the same time as this initiative was emerging out of the Commonwealth IGF discussions. So there was a great sort of um, coming together there, quite as it, as it transpired fortuitously, but it came together and, and then uh, uh, we were able to go to the heads of government um, with, a, with a coherent um, approach to this issue. But that's my thoughts on that. I don't know if any others have anything to add? I don't see Bernadette. Did you want to quickly comment on that? I just wanted to draw reference to the um, one of the ITU's projects in the Caribbean. It is the a project for enhancing competitiveness, and what the ITU did was it assisted the Caribbean in the development of a set of model laws um, for cybersecurity. So there are a number of different aspects, different bills uh, that were produced that each country would then take and uh, do the necessary uh, adjustments for its, its local, uh, its local um, environment. And that has worked very well with respect to having harmonized, a harmonized legal framework across the region. It's being implemented now. Thank you. Very interesting. Thanks very much, uh, Bernadette, for that uh, uh, very uh, important piece of information. Uh, now we had another comment from. From I'm sorry, I've got your name now. Bolt. Uh, Bolt. Okay, Bald. great. Thanks. I want to bounce off from what the gentleman from uh, EU told about ICANN and representative uh, Benoni about that, and what everybody more or less said, uh, including Dave. Hi, Dave. You can't see me. <laughs> Greetings, also. Um, that. Uh, I want to make two things explicit and then <laughs> take a jump. The first one is when you drafted the EU, or the, sorry, the UK law in 2000, 1996, whatever, around that time, it had something probably to do with a paddle and a creek because you didn't know where you were, the, the, as, a, as an expression goes. Um, that the countries that are now talking about are not in the same position because they have knowledge of 16 years to profit from. So it's not like they have to reinvent everything. No, first thing is I think they can actually use the best practices around. The second thing I want to make more explicit is that this project has the chance to set the standard for the whole world. As you can use the best things around and take this is good, this, is, this doesn't work in that country, but that doesn't in another country, combine that. So my, my uh, if I'm allowed to, to make one, would be that not just look at individual countries, but try to set a standard which the next project after Ghana is could actually benefit from because you have something on the shelf that says, this is what works in, in the world. Do you want this? Okay, let's not do that one because you don't want it, but the rest is there for you to start implementing and we'll help you with. So that's, I think, uh, something which 
a lot of people could benefit from and not lose on the view of the country. Thanks very much. Um, that was certainly a consideration that we had in the UK government, that this um, initiative could indeed capture some best practice and, uh, and uh, real opportunities for uh, uh, disseminating quick, uh, efficient, effective action to tackle cybercrime. We couldn't just let these issues sort of um, drift and, and uh, different approaches be taken and, and uh, expertise that could be deployed um, was 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 um, you know uh, th that opportunity was not uh, effectively taken up. Now, Nigel, do you wanted to come in on that? Yes, thank you. If I uh, could just 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 very briefly, indeed, I think it was a very interesting uh, question, uh, and uh, I'm not sure that we we we're, we're well. Certainly, I'm not qualified to give you give you an answer, but I think one of the one of the issues this brings up is that you know each each country. Is, is sovereign, and al although in the European Union we, you know, we've we've pulled our, our laws to an extent in certain areas, it, 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 you know, there's only certain areas one pulls one's laws, and I, what I, what I don't think we can get into here is a, is a, is a, is a debate about what you do in, in in particular circumstances. I mean, clearly, as as Bernadette says, if you if you go to model laws, if you go to cooperation, if you go to uh, you know frameworks, then that that's excellent in terms of cooperation and everything else. Uh, but I, I, I think there's only so far you can go. And this, this rather reminds me of a, of a proposal that someone was uh, putting forward to the, uh, to the ITU for the, for the wicket discussions in, uh, in Dubai. And, the and I, I won't say who's putting forward this proposal, but this proposal to me was just was, was sim symptomatic, if you like, of, of, of this issue. Which, and you really do have to think about these things carefully in terms of human rights and freedoms and the open society because essentially what the proposal was was that if, if in your country you had data and that data had arisen through an illegal action in one country then you should have the right or you should be obliged in your country to, if you like, intercept that data or, or take that data out of the system. So in its simplest form, if you had a piece of content which was illegal in country A but was bypassing another country, then you would be obliged to, if you like, block it or intercept it or take it off the internet. And if you think of the implications of that, and I'm not saying that's exactly the same as what the question was because we were talking about cybercrime, but you know there are some common elements of it. I think you go down a very slippery slope indeed. But I'll I'll shut up because I've got to go anyway. But uh, thank you. Well, thank you, Nigel. That's um, a very very use very useful and uh, stimulating uh, thought for us here, and uh, a warning as well there. So um, we'll let you go at this point if you have to. Uh, go in. But thanks very much for your contributions. Now, okay, do okay, you wanted to come in? Thanks. It's just to add some information. The HIPCAR project that Bernadette spoke of is one arm of a three-region project. There's, there was one in the Pacific, there was one in Africa, and there was one in the Caribbean. I, I don't have any direct knowledge of what happened in Africa and the Pacific, but in the Caribbean, it seemed to be excellent at pulling together all the bits that would go together and this initiative if it were able to pick up what the ITU had done in the other two regions because they they were supposed to cross feed but I'm not sure whether the cross feeding ever happened so it was just to let you know about that I don't remember the acronyms for the other two sorry I can get them for you well thanks and in ITU indeed are um, uh, a partner in this initiative, so we can certainly um, pick up that point uh, with them. Now, um, let's turn to Vlada to um, uh, explain how Diplo, who we, uh, I'm sure many of us know very well, are very active in many countries um, in, the, in the area of capacity building, training, skills, and so on. Um, how is this initiative actually going to complement Diplo 
And what will Diplo bring to this initiative, I guess, are my, my questions for you. Vlada, thanks very much. Thank you, Mark. I'm, firstly, I'm happy that I finally s succeeded to send an email, which is quite a success today. <laughs> so <laughs> I could be easy going with this. Uh, I, I don't want to, to talk uh, much about Di Diplo, and I'm, I'm happy that, I mean, the fellows that are here and around are speaking enough about Diplo uh, instead of me. Uh, I rather want to focus on how do I see, and we've been talking a lot about capacity building as one of the key priorities of the initiative. And uh, something that, that we have in mind when we, whenever we are doing capacity building programs is the importance of the holistic view. We mentioned that already. Uh, when it comes to cybersecurity it's, or cybercrime, it's quite similar to the internet governance perspective. Uh, when we're talking about cybersecurity, we need to talk or have in mind as well the other aspects of internet governance which are interrelated, such as human rights, privacy, uh, access, diversity, and so on. So whoever is working on, on policy documents and implementation of cybersecurity strategy and cybercrime has to have it in mind which means all the, because of the complexity of internet governance, cyber security as well in, in sense of multidisciplinarity, everyone has to have full awareness, a holistic picture of the internet governance. So that's about the topics, that's about what. The second question is who, and we already mentioned a number of uh, different levels which we need to address with capacity building. Our focus mostly in Diplo is uh, policy makers and as we would put it, policy shapers, decision makers and policy shapers. But besides that, and there are many other types of capacity building, and we mentioned, we need to target, okay, law enforcement, we need to target business, small and medium enterprises. There have been a lot of discussions, a lot of analysis that small and medium enterprises, in fact, are the, the most vulnerable um, components because they don't have capacity to fight and even understand the risks. And that includes not only software and hardware approaches or whatever, the awareness, that includes also the operational policies because there is a lot of, um, of, of um, social attacks into the network. So including the awareness of the, of the business, and then of course the end users, as Deirdre said, uh, and all of us uh, when it comes to the awareness. Then the third layer, th that's the level of, of who we should target. The, the, the next layer, uh, level is, is the layers uh, or where it should be. And we mentioned the global level because it's indispensable, internet is global, regional level and national levels, because everyone, as some of the folks mentioned, every country has their own even understanding of what is appropriate, what is not appropriate, uh, and that should be fine-tuned. And then finally, when we were talking about how to involve other countries, uh, if we are doing something for Ghana, how can we make sure that other countries get know about what's happening? Our experience, and we do a lot of things online, uh, most of our courses are online, and uh, aside from the cost efficient, uh, efficiency and the way that people can really communicate in an online environment, there is another component that if you, for instance, form a group of people from Ghana uh, going into some component, of capacity building component of, about cybersecurity, you can easily involve a couple of people from other countries with almost none costs. So they can be part of this capacity building initiative take the experience and even get aware that, oh, we need to do this in our countries as well. So online type of work and online activities are really, really precious. And after all, I mean, we are quite much into that, so we can help to a large extent. Thank you. Thank you, Vlada. Um, indeed, it's, I think, imperative that this initiative do as much as possible online, because it gives us that uh, valuable outreach and, and sharing of uh, of um, uh, information and um, opportunities to um, uh, for, for the partners in the initiative to, to engage. So um, very much agree with that. Um, I was interested in your point about SMEs in particular, and I was wondering if um, you think this initiative and, and, and um, the wealth of expertise that the partners bring to this initiative can lead to some sort of generic approach by the Commonwealth. Um, I mentioned right at the beginning the Commonwealth Business Council as a partner. Um, I'm hoping we can um, activate them to be, uh, you know, to, on some of these, some of this initiative work. I don't, I'm not sure how, but perhaps the point you made about SMEs is is an example of that. That we can generically across the Commonwealth. Uh, promote, um, uh, I don't know, maybe a toolkit or something like that that would help SMEs uh, understand the risks, understand what they can do to uh, 
uh, to mitigate those risks and how they should uh, react to um, criminality uh, on, on the web that's going to impact on them. Did you have a thought on, on that? Well, I think this is, this is a good approach. What I see as, uh, as a possible problem is the lack of, uh, at least my experience, the lack of uh, mm, capacities of, of small, medium enterprises to even think about it, to even consider this is important because those, those are companies which have a couple of people, 10 people, whatever, they don't have capacity even to, to understand that they need it. And then, of course, to have the right approach so that they can learn more on that and, and use it. Uh, kind, kinds of manuals or kinds of uh, probably uh, tailored capacity building programs or awareness, awareness building at least for the, for the first step is definitely something that, that should be done. But there is more, and I'm not sure probably someone from business um, could, could s let us know what the ideas could be to bring small and medium enterprises into this and to make them feel that this is really important for their business. And it's not such a big investment if they have such a support. Thanks, Vlada. I think, Bernadette, you wanted to comment on this? Thank you. Yes, I certainly agree. We have worked with the Chambers of Commerce in, in the different countries to start getting that message out. And I, I think you've just mentioned a, a Commonwealth Business Council. Council? I think there should be engagement at that level. They would help to get the message out. Okay, thanks very much. We have more remote participants coming through, which is great. The system's working, and I really appreciate that. So, uh, Jasper, yeah, can you uh, uh, introduce the uh, calls? Yeah, thanks. Of course. So, we have a question from Nigel Kazemeyer, and he asks Beyond the initiative, is there any need <coughs> for stronger international measures like treaties to effectively address cybercrime? Thanks, that's a pretty heavy question. <laughs> um, I mean, the UK approach generally to the cyber field is not to engage at a kind of treaty-making level, but let's get into um, efficient, expedient action and through cooperation, partnerships, multi-stakeholder engagement and so on. So that's coming from a UK government perspective. I don't know if others have anything to add to that. Uh, Lara, you want to come in? But uh, this is quite a, a, a tricky uh, question. But um, the initiative has always said from the consultation period um, last year up until the IGF of last year, and this is uh, going to carry on, I think that the initiative will strive to be as politically neutral as possible. So I think we're working with what there is at the moment. And um, uh, obviously the whole program is a collaborative approach, I think. I, I can't remember who mentioned it. It is the requesting state that makes decisions of this nature. Obviously, I mean, there are organizations like the ITU, Council of Europe, around the table, and it's up to that requesting state to make these sorts of decisions. The CCI is bringing everybody together and then encourage the, the, the requesting state to make decisions. Okay, thanks, Laura. Should we Go on to the second qu remote question. Thank you, Jasper. So the second question is from Alex Middleton from the Aberystwyth University again. And he asks, how important is it to draw a distinction between industrial espionage in cyberspace from other forms of cybercrime? Some very challenging questions <laughs> coming through from Aberystwyth. This is uh, quite, uh, as I'm vaguely from that part of the world, North Wales myself. I, uh, uh, I very welcome uh, Alvarez with uh, contributing so much to this, but that's quite a, quite a question. Um, industrial espionage. I don't think we've ever talked about it in our um, discussions. Lara may correct me, but I'm, I'm not aware that we've ever contemplated um, industrial espionage. Um, um, in those terms, obviously criminality where you have um, deception and intervention um, in um, um, a corporate um, enterprise through uh, hacking and, 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 and so on, I guess that kind of uh, enters the field of uh, uh, um, industrial espionage. But um, 
We'll note that one for reference and think about it a bit further. I don't know if anybody else can help me out <laughs> with a more uh, coherent. Vlada, do you want to uh, comment on that? Thank you. I'm, I'm just thinking now, brainstorming probably on the lines what, what Dave said earlier, uh, that um, any kind of, uh, of uh, attack or hacking or whatever that comes f with, with uh, an idea for economic uh, advantage is a cybercrime issue. So in this sense, the economic espionage has obvious industrial espionage obviously has uh, economic um, aims and could be considered as, as a cybercrime. But I guess, again, at the end, it should be on the level of countries to decide what they want and what they don't want to. I mean, they, have, they should have all the support on identifying and clarifying all the issues and limits and so on, different approaches. And I think it's up to the country at the end to decide what they want. So I'll take a shot at that. Thank you, Vlada. Bernadette? Yes, I just wanted to go back to Vlada's um, earlier comment about cyber security. And I think that is the thing that we need to focus on because cyber crime is going to take on all sorts of forms that we could not, we, we did not envision and anticipate. But the thing is to develop a culture of being uh, of cyber uh, being cy aware uh, an aware a culture of, of awareness a culture of being uh, taking the necessary precautions every step of the way and i think these things really fall into your that cyber security framework of which cyber crime is an element Thanks very much, Bernadette. And Dave, you wanted to uh, come in now uh, as well on this. Thanks. Yeah, I think um, espionage you know, you know, has a lot of different um, facets. Um, if it is you know, for, for, for you know, commercial gain um, by either an individual as a result of, of um, coercion or um, as a result of selling it to another private company, it's a crime. If it's a nation state that's perpetrating it, um, for example, uh, for the purpose of, you know, of examining a, 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 a another country's um, you know, um, infrastructure uh, you know, as, an in, you know, as a precursor to um, you know, some form of attack, um, it has a very, very different um, twist. And there's a, the other um, you know, uh, fairly uh, worrisome and growing concern is um, cyber esp espionage to um, strip a, 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 a nation of its competitive edge. So uh, I, w I think when Bernadette was mentioning that, that you know, um, sometimes this can be left to an individual country, um, at least in two of those circumstances, I can see that it can be left to an individual country to, to decide um, whether to retaliate um, or how to, how to act diplomatically or otherwise. Um, there are probably opportunities for us to define um, common law that would say that this kind of act um, perpetrated for commercial, you know, or for, for profit, um, you know, is is a crime and it will be treated uniformly among either the Commonwealth or a broader set of countries. Thanks, Dave. I I don't know. Perhaps Laura will correct me, having. Um seen the individual requests that have, have been coming in for assistance and initiative, but um, has, th has this featured in any of the requests, in, in, you know, concerns expressed by individual administrations that they feel threatened by outsiders, whether perhaps even state-sponsored, but certainly, um, you know, um, possibly um, threats coming from other competitive corporate entities, perhaps. I don't know. I'm just... Just wondering, is, what, what do you think? No, so far it has not featured on any of the requests that we have received. Um, mm. The requests that we have received have always focused on the economic uh, um, aspect that we are talking about earlier and ensuring that a country can address cyber criminality um, in collaboration with other, uh, other nation states and, and is part of 24-7 you know, networks, etc. So no. Okay, thanks, Laura, and thanks, thanks to the question. I think um, it's an indication that this initiative actually could needs to explore other potential areas, you know, that um, uh, may may crop up. If, 
perhaps at a, perhaps more at a strategic strategic level rather than um, if we're not uh, receiving any th any particular reference to um, this kind of um, threat or, uh, or or manifestation of uh, um, uh, competitive attack, if you like, if that's the economic attack, if, if that's the right phrase. Anyway, um, we have one more remote. It's a follow-up question, uh, as it were, to to earlier. So Nigel Thomas asks, how can it be left to the individual country when it's cross-border? So maybe a bit of clarification on the statement. In reference to the, the treaty. Yeah. Well, I think that it is, uh, uh, as Nigel pointed out, it is a, a matter of having um, each country as a sovereign state, and it is up to them to make decisions on whether there is, well, at the moment there isn't a, 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 a global treaty. Well, there is, the, there's the Council of Europe Budapest, yes? And um, I still think it is up to each individual country to make that decision. I mean, I think that is um, what Mark will agree with. I think most of the people around the, 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 the table will agree with. Did I answer that question? I well think, it, I think must always, it must always lie with each sovereign country to make these sorts of decisions for their country. Okay, Bernadette, you, d you had a comment on this. Uh, I yes, I, uh, what, I, uh, what Lara said is exactly right. At the end of the day, your strategy for dealing with uh, cybercrime, it is going to be as strong as the weakest link in the whole system, and therefore, governments, there are things that must be put in place at the national level. Um, so yes, countries, but it, it, it is a, a global phenomena. It must be that there is collaboration at the international and regional levels, but there are things that countries have to put in place. And I'll give a very simple example, uh, uh, an example of a cyber threat. When a country or an individual or an organization receives a, thri a cyber threat, what do they do with that? What are the mechanisms for escalating that? Those are things that have to be done at the national level. Um, so um, it is a collaborative effort, but there are things that must be put in place at the national level. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Bernadette. Yeah, Volt, yeah. you wanted to come in on this. Thanks. Yes, it's working. I'm going to be provocative here, not just personally stating, but we heard yesterday and today about the incumbent telecommunication company with a mobile operator that said that they have to rethink their business model because otherwise they may be extinct pretty soon. The other one is on corporate discussion on copyright and that sort of thing, and also this branch of business has to reinvent itself to get a new business model in the online world. So then, I already said it in another panel, so it's not totally new, but it's a new thought. Governments are, are confronted with something which is so transnational that it's even beyond any border, apparently, at the moment, and are struggling with actually the, 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 the trying to get back to the world they were used to. But governments may have to rethink themselves also in the coming 10 to 20 years because it's the same the world is changing fast and this m will be a very hard thought for governments but there has to come something new over the time and of course at this present day and age it's the national government that is deciding something but we have to think about the boundaries which this problem is causing us because the bad guys to stick with them right now have found every opportunity at this moment and beyond what we ever were capable of thinking two years ago. And just to quote a gentleman from the Sir Finnish Surf in Botnet Center in Finland which uh, he said that if we don't start acting today with every year we don't do anything, the problem is exponentially so much bigger that we will come to a date that there's nothing to be done anymore because we're too smart. So that is very challenging, but it's something we, 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 I'm not working for the government anymore, but governments will have to rethink 
over the coming years on how to deal with this new world, because it's a new world out there. Thank you, Walt. There's some very um, important comments you've made there, which effectively wrap up this session. We actually do have to wrap it up now, I think, at 6 o'clock. So uh, you've, you've kind of usurped my role in a way. Uh, 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 but I, I do appreciate that, uh, that contribution, because I think there is some important uh, rethinking that needs to be done. And um, I think this initiative is, has the potential for being a very valuable vehicle for doing that. You know, we've got some great partners. We can tap into some great policy expertise, some great practical and operational expertise. And we've got the backing of the Commonwealth uh, government. So uh, it, it augurs well for c keeping up with the criminality, if you like, of the web and, and, um, and uh, trying to to actually even maybe steal a march on them. I think that's all an objective that uh, we, we do share. And um, so, I, uh, unless there is one last minute, we can squeeze one in, Jasper. Shall we squeeze it in? Go on. Very quickly then, yeah, thanks. So, Elizabeth Dunkerley from Aberystwyth University. Um, <laughs> If each country is a sovereign state, how can multinational business formulate a strategy to deal with cybercrime? We'll note that one. Thank you. We, I, I do appreciate it. I, I'm seriously, though. We'll, we'll note, we just haven't got time to deal with that. It's quite a heavy question. And the next one, yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll note these questions. And of course, there is the blogging uh, opportunity through the web site that. Uh, we can take this discussion further. But it's say the next one, yeah, Jasper, thanks. I think the next one's quite a difficult one as well. How, might, how would you create a good balance between individual rights, such as privacy, and the battle against cybercrime? Okay, anybody got, can answer that in 30 seconds? No, I don't see. Oh, Vlada, go on, you have a go then. <laughs> Just make sure that uh, whatever you do in capacity building includes the holistic view, so that everyone is aware of, and include all the, the stakeholders, of course. Great, thanks very much. Very briefly, Walt. You have to do the mic. I, I think a very important lesson is, don't do something just because you can, technically, before thinking what it may actually lead to. And that's a lesson that with implementing things on the internet, we haven't started really dealing with yet. But this is a very personal observation. Okay. I really do feel I have to wrap up now because everybody will be wanting to head off. So um, I just want to thank the panelists. I'm afraid um, Sala Tamani Kai Waimaro wasn't able to join us despite my gallant effort to practice pronouncing her surname. Um, anyway, I hope uh, the message gets back that I did try uh, to do that. Um, but certainly I want to thank Dave, middle of the night, contributing here remotely. Dave Piscatello, the um, security technologist with, with ICANN. Uh, Vlada uh, Radunovic from Diplo. Um, Bernadette Lewis, thank you very much for, for joining us with, with regard to the Caribbean perspective. Uh, in, in this initiative, much appreciate that. Uh, Lara for the Secretariat, and um, really appreciate uh, your support and contribution for this initiative. And last but not least, I want to thank Aberystwyth University for making this workshop so stimulating and such a success. So thank you all in Aberystwyth. Um, and thank you those who are physically attending here, and those who contributed questions. They've been very challenging, very, informative for this initiative and I think um, it's we've had a good sense of uh, the kind of range of issues that this initiative is is going to be dealing with and uh, uh, I hope you will, you will continue to engage with this initiative through the website to, to um, contribute your thoughts and ideas and to spread the word and get other stakeholders to give their views and uh, contribute to this whole holistic approach to to tackling cybercrime that uh, we're, we're endeavoring to um, um, engineer with this, with this initiative. So thanks very much, everybody, and uh, 
Uh, enjoy your evening and uh, the rest of the uh, meeting here in Baku. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.